Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ukraine the Possible, the podcast with a social justice perspective, a view from inside a nation resisting imperialist invasion, a voice in search of solidarity. In this episode, we will discuss a critical aspect of Russia's war against Ukraine, the issue of mine territories. We'll quantify the extent of these lands and examine the profound impact of mines on people, the environment, and the economy. Additionally, we'll assess the time, resources, and funding needed for demining. This war, seemingly far from conclusion, has already created the largest minefields in human history. The area is comparable in size to countries such as the United Kingdom, Romania, or the US state of Arizona. Due to the Russian invasion, Ukrainian lands are now contaminated with a staggering amount of explosives. Walking through the streets of Ukrainian cities, one can easily notice illuminated light boxes, once used for advertising, now serving as warnings about the danger of mines and unexploded ordnance left after bombings. Thousands of unexploded munitions remain scattered across abandoned homes, streets, playgrounds, fields, forests, and road verges. Under no circumstances should anyone touch these items, neither with hands, feet, nor in any other way. It's best to step back to a safe distance of at least 100 meters and mark the location of the suspicious object. Despite warnings and extensive public awareness campaigns, tragedies cannot always be prevented. Reports regularly emerge in Ukrainian media about civilians being injured or killed by mines or explosive devices, especially in areas where battles took place or in territories reclaimed by Ukrainian forces. Farmers, agricultural workers, and forestry employees are often victims, and children frequently suffer as they pick up unfamiliar objects, bring them home, and attempt to dismantle them. Until February 24, 2022, according to international statistics, Ukraine ranked fourth globally in the number of casualties from mines and explosive devices, following Afghanistan, Mali, and Yemen. From 2014 to 2020, Ukraine recorded 1,190 casualties. Currently, Ukraine has unfortunately claimed the top spot worldwide. Almost every day, these circumstances lead to tragedies. By the end of 2023, official reports documented 277 deaths and 608 injuries from mines since the full-scale invasion. Since then, the number of victims has increased. Unfortunately, the toll of injuries and deaths from mines is expected to rise in the future. The State Emergency Service of Ukraine, previously focused on firefighting, disaster response and rescues, now includes demining in its responsibilities. Since the start of the full-scale war, rescuers have neutralized approximately 464,000 explosive items. On their website, the Emergency Service publishes an interactive map of territories contaminated with explosive items. The map displays locations where explosive items have been detected or are likely to be present with a location accuracy of up to 30 meters. This map is recommended for use when visiting areas affected by military actions. Ukrainians can report discovered mines through the Demining Ukraine app launched by authorities. A symbol of efforts to rid the country of mine contamination is Patron, a dog serving as a mine detection canine. In May 2022, Volodymyr Zelensky awarded Patron the For Loyal Service Medal. The total area of lands that need to be cleared of landmine contamination is approximately 250,000 square kilometers, more than 40% of Ukraine's territory. The situation is most severe in areas where battles were more intense. In Donetsk Oblast, for instance, the density of landmines reaches up to five mines per square meter. Humanitarian demining teams categorize victims of landmines and unexploded ordnance into three types. The first type includes individuals unaware that an area may be dangerous, often including refugees returning home. The second type comprises those willing to take risks because, for example, an alternative route is too lengthy. The third type encompasses individuals who walk through hazardous areas, spot explosive devices, and decide to take them for scrap metal or souvenirs, or simply to examine them closely, perhaps out of curiosity. As mentioned earlier, children are often among the victims, picking up deadly discoveries out of curiosity, 
or playing in trenches or bunkers. Educating the public is typically a key aspect of what is referred to as humanitarian demining. People need to learn how to identify dangerous areas and recognize signs such as cut trees, trenches, green painted stakes, remnants of boxes and warning signs. This knowledge will be crucial for years to come, as locals must remain vigilant. However, a challenge arises as people living near hazardous areas may become less cautious over time, increasing risks. In Ukraine, there is a humanitarian demining center, a government agency with the primary task of clearing agricultural lands of mines and ordnance. The government also issues licenses for demining to non-governmental companies and organizations, granting them the status of operators for demining operations. Currently, the Ukrainian government is implementing an action plan for demining agricultural lands. This plan involves the initial survey and demining of over 470,000 hectares of land in nine regions of the country, with a particular focus on demining agricultural lands in the deoccupied south. Demining is categorized into three types. Combat, demining, taking place directly on the front lines, conducted by military sappers. Operational demining, involves the emergency clearance of critical infrastructure objects and the disposal of detected explosive items. Besides military sappers, specialists from the State Emergency Service or the National Guard may be involved. Humanitarian demining, conducted by certified civilian deminers who report dangerous items to sappers instead of removing them. This is the final stage of surveying and cleaning a territory, ensuring 100% safety. The process of returning previously mined territory to life begins with humanitarian demining. Let's follow step by step how this happens. A non-technical survey group travels from village to village, gathering information about potentially contaminated areas. Specialists communicate with the local population and authorities. Local communities prioritize the areas to address first. The miners then define the boundaries of the surveyed territory. Coordination with nearby hospitals is essential to ensure they provide assistance in case of any incidents. The process starts with a visual overview. The deminer collects visible items, removes vegetation layers and, using a metal detector, gathers items buried up to 15 centimeters deep. Since the fighting took place recently, explosive objects are unlikely to be located deeper. If the device indicates a metallic object, the demoner digs it up. If it's a regular piece of metal, they remove it. It could be a rusty bucket, horseshoe, nail, anything. Every metallic item must be cleared from the field. If explosive items are found, they are marked and military or emergency services are called to collect and dispose of them. Following this, internal and external quality control takes place with experts from the National Demining Center conducting the verification. If successful, the territory is declared mine-free. The most common are unexploded artillery, aviation and cluster munitions. Many of these munitions from the Russian army simply did not function as intended, possibly due to storage conditions or manufacturing defects. In some areas, Russian forces left mines that react to changes in the magnetic field. However, one of the most dangerous types responds to human footsteps. It reacts not to the weight of the person stepping on it, but to the approaching steps detected by built-in sensors. This type of mine can cause casualties within a 30 meter radius after detonation. Additionally, there might be multiple mines, and when someone rushes to help the injured after the first explosion, the second mine detonates. Fortunately, mines of this modification are expensive and less common. More frequently encountered are small lethal anti-personnel mines triggered by the weight of a human body. Russia extensively mined the front line in anticipation of Ukraine's counter-offensive and actively used widely banned anti-personnel mines. Investigations by Human Rights Watch revealed that Russian forces use no fewer than 13 types of anti-personnel mines, as well as mine traps. After the occupation, the first priority for demining is the territory adjacent to residential homes and road shoulders. 
essentially areas that people will use. Everything can be mined. Ukrainian military reported finding mine traps in apartments after the occupation. These mines were aimed not so much against the military as against civilians. For example, refrigerator doors or detergent boxes in washing machines might be mined. Upon the withdrawal of Russian forces, it was discovered that many cemeteries in the occupied territories were also mined. Ukrainian authorities had to repeatedly issue special warnings, urging the population to avoid visiting cemeteries until they were checked for mines. After the withdrawal of Russian forces from the infamous town of Bucha, 20 booby-trapped bodies and other explosive devices based on hand grenades and landmines were discovered in the city. The documented use of such traps by Russian military extends to other areas as well. Placing explosive devices in residential areas lacks a clear military objective. The mining territory is a costly endeavor. According to World Bank estimates, the mining Ukraine ranges from $2 to $8 per square meter, amounting to around $37 billion over the next 10 years. It is evident that the country cannot handle this task alone. Currently, the primary donors for demining efforts in Ukraine are international partners. Demining is also a time-consuming process. Among those engaged in humanitarian demining, there's a saying, a year of war equals five years of sapper work. Typically, demining a designated area takes from three months to six months, depending on the surveyed area's size and contamination. If agricultural land is designated as mined territory, understandably, it cannot be cultivated. For many farmers, especially those with small holdings, land use is a matter of survival. Hence, uncertified black deminers emerge in the market. In a short period, they may use metal detectors on agricultural fields. The problem is that this does not guarantee that a tractor won't trigger a mine explosion tomorrow. Unfortunately, such incidents are not uncommon. The expenses of a demining operator are practically impossible to cover, even with the resources of a large agro company. These sums are colossal. The only possible financial model in this situation is assistance from donors. Although Ukrainian state banks already offer low interest rate loans for demining to farmers, it may take a farmer decades to offset such expenses. An essential issue is the technical equipment of demining units. In simple terms, Ukraine needs demining machines. Manufacturers from various countries are ready to supply such machines, but currently there is insufficient funding. Since the demand for demining is enormous, efforts are underway to develop and produce mechanical demining machines in Ukraine. Reports have mentioned a Ukrainian engineer, formerly employed at a tank factory, planning to create a prototype demining machine based on a regular tractor. The tractor needs to be equipped with adapted demining equipment, including a large drum that triggers mines. The mine explodes and the drum needs repair, but without human casualties. According to the engineer's plan, the tractor will be remotely controlled, eliminating the need for operator protection. If the idea works, the machine could process 25 hectares of land in a single working day. The Swiss Foundation for Mine Action in Ukraine also aims to significantly expedite Demeaner's work with machinery. The foundation recently added a mechanical demining machine, MV10, to its fleet. This is the first of its kind in Ukraine. The machine allows for vegetation removal and soil preparation, speeding up the miners' operations. Thanks to this machine, the time spent in fields will be significantly reduced. Additionally, this is a much safer demining method as it eliminates direct human contact with explosive objects. The MV10 robotic demining machine can withstand the explosion of anti-vehicle mines. With the onset of full-scale war, the demand for deminers has multiplied. Sappers are needed directly in combat zones and for operational demining. Despite a shortage of personnel, the Swiss Foundation doubled its staff. The problem was solved by recruiting foreign specialists who had worked in Somalia, Iraq and other countries. A bonus is that many of them are well versed in both the Soviet and NATO ammunition systems. However, not only machines can assist in demining, specially trained dogs are also effective. To protect them, special footwear, protective goggles and body armor are used. 
Unfortunately, not all trained dogs have such protection. Experiences from other countries that have undergone armed conflicts, from Cambodia to Kosovo, hint at the challenges Ukraine may face during its recovery. Cambodia, covered with millions of landmines after decades of conflict, has been the subject of demining operations for 30 years. According to experts, at least another five years of work is required. Tens of thousands of people have been maimed by Cambodian mines. In Kosovo, an armed conflict occurred in 1998 and 1999. Although the Kosovo war lasted six months, demining took decades. Not only land, but also the sea is mined. Drifting mines have become a problem not only for Ukraine, but also for other countries in the Black Sea Basin. Last summer, in Romania, near one of the resort villages, a sea mine exploded. According to local authorities, the naval mine struck a pier and detonated. The explosion did not cause serious damage. The mine exploded about 300 meters from the beach, where many tourists were at the time. One man suffered hearing damage. This was not an isolated incident. In early 2024, Turkey, Bulgaria and Romania signed an agreement to demine the Black Sea, collectively tackling drifting sea mines. Since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia, these mines pose a significant threat to navigation in the Black Sea. However, the efforts of these three countries will be limited for now, focusing solely on international waters. To illustrate, if you draw a line from Odessa to the Bosporus, they will be demining waters west of this line, stretching from the former Grain Corridor line westward to the territorial waters of Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey. While the war continues, the participating countries won't expand this initiative towards Ukrainian territorial waters, fearing Russia's reaction. Hence, Ukraine will have to deal with demining its waters on its own. Ukraine is undertaking a large-scale special operation to demine the Black and Azov seas. Currently, in the active phase of the operation, demining primarily focuses on maritime communication routes, essentially trade routes. This stage will last three to five months, but the overall demining operation will take much longer, between three to five years. Unfortunately, even after this, there will still be work in the Black Sea, considering that remnants of weaponry from the First and Second World Wars are periodically discovered in the sea waters. Given the high level of contamination by the Russian Federation, this work will continue for many years. Now, let's talk about something unimaginable before the invasion, mines at a nuclear power plant. In the summer of 2023, reports surfaced that International Atomic Energy Agency observers at the occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant witnessed anti-personnel mines around the facility. The International Nuclear Agency stated that its team observed mines in a restricted zone. Thus, Russian military deems it plausible to mine a facility like a nuclear power station. The presence of such explosives on the site does not comply with IAEA safety standards and recommendations for nuclear safety. Thus, the war may lead to a potential radiation leak from a facility that is one of the world's top 10 largest nuclear power stations. While six reactors of the station have been shut down for several months, it still requires electricity and qualified personnel to operate critical cooling systems and other safety functions. Landmine contamination is sometimes compared to radiation pollution. In both cases, the territory becomes uninhabitable, forcing people to leave. It's quite likely that new exclusion zones, akin to the Chernobyl exclusion zone, will emerge in Ukraine where human access will be restricted and nature will recover without human intervention. We can recall the consequences of the Falklands War between the UK and Argentina in 1982. Argentine forces landed on the islands and laid thousands of mines along the coast to prevent a British counter-attack. After the UK regained control of the islands, part of the territory remained uncleared, as it turned out to be expensive and risky. And then, penguins settled in the fenced-off areas. These birds, with bodies too light for mines to trigger, could now live and reproduce peacefully. Details about the environmental impact of armed conflicts can be found in one of the previous podcast episodes.
In conclusion, no one knows how much longer the hostilities in Ukraine will last. Recent statements from Russian authorities suggest they have no intention of stopping. Regardless, each day of war increases the resources and time needed for future demining. This is the danger inherited by future generations, and echoes of the Great War will be heard for decades in Ukrainian forests and fields even after victory. This podcast relies on credible sources, which are detailed in the description. For further reference, you can access the materials through the provided links.